heaven. All our hopes of having an intercessor, all our hopes of having a comforter and a helper called the Holy Spirit, all our hopes of having the Spirit teach us all the things that Jesus said are bound up in those words. Paul tells us if Jesus isn't risen, we are fools. We're fools for gathering here. We're fools for believing things if they really didn't happen. And yet we're thankful that up from the grave he arose. We pray that these thoughts might generate worship, generate thanksgiving, generate a sense of awe and wonder about the work of salvation that's been done on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, hymn 311 is our first hymn, a hymn concerning the meeting again in Jesus' name. 311. to Faith Reformed Baptist Church. We appreciate you being with us. Those who are joining by uh, way of uh, internet, uh, online streaming, we appreciate you join, joining us as well. You can find our uh, services on Facebook and on uh, YouTube and on Sermon Audio. So uh, remember those things. Remember that we meet uh, three times every Lord's Day. We meet at uh, 10 a.m. for uh, the teaching hour, 11 a.m. for the worship service, and at 5 we meet again for another worship service. And all these services, all these gatherings feature the uh, exposition of God's Word. And so uh, that's our focus. That is, uh, that's what we do. And so please... Uh, Join us in all those meetings on Wednesday evenings at 6.30. We meet uh, for prayer, and we spend our time in prayer. We focus on the needs of the church and the needs of our nation, our missionaries, and all those things. So uh, remember Wednesday evening, and every month our men uh, and our ladies each have uh, uh, a fellowship meeting. And the men's uh, uh, fellowship meeting, the next one will be April the 20th. The ladies will be April the 10th. And uh, we get together, study God's word and fellowship, and eat a little bit uh, as well. 
next next uh, Sunday is our uh, uh, what do we call it fellowship meal after the morning service so bring some food and uh, uh, share with us and we'll spend some time fellowshipping with one another and uh, if you don't have food to bring then come on anyway we would enjoy having you we want to remember uh, to wish Jean Mink, our pianist, a happy birthday this week. And uh, so we're thankful for the privilege to be at church. And we're here as every Sunday, every Lord's Day, is a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have met to worship him. Thank God we serve a living mm -hmm. Savior. And he has died for our sins, but that did not end the story of his work. He arose, and he is alive today, and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father, making intercession for his people and, uh, uh, and ruling in his kingdom from the throne of God. So we're thankful to worship our Lord together. Let's go to the Lord now in a time of prayer. Seek his face for our time. Our Lord, we lift up our hearts and our voices unto you. We want to worship and adore you. We want to give glory, honor, and praise to your name because you, O oh God, are worthy. We want to thank you that uh, you, in your wisdom, even before the world began, uh, you set your love upon your people and you established, you decreed the plan of redemption to bring sinners into right relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Now, I thank you that you did that by giving your son. I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to take upon yourself our sin, to die in our place, to suffer the brutality of the rage of God's wrath against sin. You absorbed it in your own body and then were buried. But thank you that you were uh, able to, because of your justice, because of your holiness, because of your obedience, and because you pleased the Father on our behalf, you were able to get up, to stand up, to walk out of the tomb mm -hmm. with victory over sin, over death, and over Satan. We thank you for your mercy to us. We thank you for your eternal saving grace that you have given to us, that you saved us by your work once for all, and uh, that uh, we are eternally yours. We thank you for the privilege to hear your word expounded to us this morning. Thank you for the teaching hour and the encouragement that we receive there and the instruction we receive there. But we also ask for your anointing on Pastor Russ mm -hmm. as he stands to proclaim your word to us this morning. May we see Jesus as we've never seen him before, we pray. Mm -hmm. We pray for those that are not able to be with us. We ask for your touch on their bodies. There are uh, several that are sick. And we ask for uh, healing for your touch on them to raise them up that they might be able to worship with us uh, once again. And Lord, we do confess that uh, uh, with uh, all that you've done for us, we've certainly come far short of honoring you like we should have this week. We've not done those things that we should have done, and we've done many of those things that we should not have done. We've said things and thought things and and uh, uh, been uh, had, had a bad spirit, a bad attitude. We have sought to entertain ourselves even with things that dishonor you. And so we ask, Lord, for your forgiveness. We ask for your cleansing. We ask that you would allow us to worship you with clean, clean hands and a pure heart. Yeah. We ask these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 
Amen. All right, let's all stand for our call to worship. This morning I'll be reading two different passages of Scripture. I'll be reading from the ESV, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, and then Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their, uh, and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, and you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, thy brother? He said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Now we see from this passage of Scripture that that the blood can cry out and the Lord hears. Mm. Now, the next passage I'm going to read from Philippians has to do with the blood of our Savior. And when you hear the word death, concerning the death of our Christ, I want you to know that the Father has heard the cry of Christ when his blood cried out on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So let's read these words from Philippians. Indeed, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like unto him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word, and now let's lift our hearts up to the Lord. Our Holy Father, we plead the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is called to us, and we, has heard, and we have heard his voice by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it is in his name that we come today, boldly because of his worthiness, but humbly because of the sin that has required it at your hands. We have brought nothing to the table for our salvation except the sin that required the death of our Lord. And so we pray, Lord, that Christ be lifted up, that the fruit of this tree might be eaten by those who hear the cry of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to justify sinners. We thank you, Lord, that you have shown the world that you have approved of his atoning work, that you yourself has heard the cry of the blood of your own son, and you have said, I accept this substitute for his people, and that he is innocent, and you have given him, Father, life over death. He is risen from the dead. And so, Father, we come to you this day praising your name and praising our Christ, that he has the keys of death and hell, and that he has given us life because we are in him. So, Father, we pray, may sinners hear and be saved today. And above all, may Christ be lifted up and glorified, and the gospel be preached clearly. Around the world, may your churches hear, and may your people receive the truth. 
and may the gospel be made clear. So, Father, glorify thyself. Receive our worship today, the hymns we sing, the prayers we pray, and may the word represent you fully. We pray this in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Hymn 143. Once more for a, a reading of a portion of Psalm 109. Psalm 109, I'll be reading the first 20 verses <clears throat> from the King James, a Psalm of David. Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have recorded, rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds, and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, he hath and let the strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any favor in his father, favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he may, might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with his garment, 
So let it come unto his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. Let it be unto him as the garment which covereth him and for the girdle which wherewith he is girded continually. Let this be the reward of mine adversaries from the Lord and of them that speak evil against my soul. This is the word of the living God. Amen. Amen. Hymn 205, a hymn that uh, is a resurrection hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. God's mercies uh, uh, to us are new every morning, uh, and one of God's mercies is the uh, men who are faithful in the ministry to preach. And uh, we have not had our brother for about a month, and we're thankful that God's mercy uh, kept him through all his uh, sickness and uh, the trouble that he faced. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can tell he's, he's stronger. Uh, let's pray now that uh, God's spirit would strengthen him as, as he comes and preaches. Uh, Before I begin, I would like to thank you all for your prayers. Uh, Even now this morning, many of you have said, I've been praying for you. Thank you so much. And you know that um, sometimes, and sometimes even in places I shouldn't, I I say things in jest. I've often referred to our church as Faith Infirmed Baptist Church because we have so many. 
that seem to be in competition with their health. And so uh, I know that there are many now among us here that I'm not the only one we should be praying for. I, I can see right now there are those that have been at home convalescing and uh, suffering also. So let's keep our brothers in prayer. Now today is a day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. It is a, a glorious time to think about God the Father publicly and with power accepting the sacrifice of our Lord after he died for our sins. There is no greater demonstration of God's approving acceptance of our sacrifice than our Lord rising from the dead. He is raised not only by the physical power of God, his omnipotence, but also raised by a moral attribute of righteousness and holiness and justice. You see, today it, my message is going to be a little bit different. I usually teach verse by verse through a book, but today is going to be a topical message. And with that, I, I do things a little bit different. The doctrine that I want to teach you about today is, that it is basically this, and I'm going to spend some time on understanding what I want you to take home, and that is this. The atonement of Christ is a continuous cry for justice, but that cry is also on our behalf to justify us. You see, God hears the blood of Christ that cries out from the ground. And he heard and he understands that the innocent was slain and God raised him from the dead. But we also hear the blood of Christ and we are justified when we hear. Now, <clears throat> the power that raised up our Christ is not just physical, it is moral. And when we follow Christ, it is the power of that moral life that enables us to live day to day, knowing that one day this flesh is going to fall and we will be raised up the way our Lord was raised up. That is the hope we have. That is the courage we have. I want all of us to be like those described in the wilderness when they came across Jordan. They were described as men of valor. And you see, the word Adam means man, and that's all of us. Men, women, children. I want us to be people of valor. That means people of courage. Courage to live their life in this present evil world, to do what is right and pleasing in the sight of God. That's walking in the power of the resurrection. Being able to do what is right when it's easier to do what is wrong and gain in this world. But we'll never lose what God has planned for us. Amen. And so with this, I want you to understand that the resurrection is something we need every single day to have us courageous, to become people of valor. We need to continuously listen to the blood of Christ that cries. Now, I've chosen the text to go over because I wanted to also give you a little bit of a lesson in, in something that I struggled with in my early life. And that is the idea of how should I read the Bible. And I hope this is going to help you with your personal Bible study. It seems to me that... Um, that many people are afraid to interpret the Bible for themselves and they come to church and I get to tell them what to believe and then they feel comfortable. But you see, every single one of us are called to read and to understand and I cannot be responsible for your responsibility to embrace on your own, your own faith. You need to believe it, not because I believe it. You need to study and understand not just what I have studied, but you need to do this yourself. Now, when I was young, I was struggling with how to do this. 
struggling. You know, there's a, there's a, a 50 cent word or an expensive word that preachers like to use, and I'm going to tell you what it is, and it's the science of, of interpreting the Bible. It's called hermeneutics. But it's just a simple word. It just means, how do I interpret the Bible? And so when I was young, I was taught that the Bible should be interpreted always literally. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the only way to understand it. That's not the only way to understand it. The idea here is that the Lord is very creative, not just in creating the world, but he has a way of communicating to us in things that are just marvelously beautiful. The Lord taught in parables. He taught using metaphors. He taught using similes, allegories. Now, this is not a literature class. I don't expect, I'm not going to grade you or anything like that. But you know what a parable is, right? It's a story. It's a story that teaches a lesson. Now, it may or may not be a factual story. And metaphors. When we say that Jesus comes out and, and just rises, raises his voice and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You must know that, you know, that he is not a physical path. He is not a candle that physically shines. But that is a metaphor that says, do you want to know the way to God? Christ is that way. Do you want to know the truth? You see, light is a metaphor. Just as the blind whose eyes are opened can see the truth can be revealed when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. The Lord teaches us in this way. The Lord says in a simile, the kingdom of God is like a seed. Now, the kingdom of God is not a seed. It's like a seed, planted, grows up to a huge tree. It can even be taught in allegories. Now, this is something that you may be familiar with with John Bunyan, you know, the Pilgrim's Progress. What an allegory. What a beautiful story. But I want you to understand that God's power in giving us the truth, he has actually taken literal people and literal history and made those events and those people an allegorical truth for us. So how can that be? Because he's God. He's able to do that. Now, that puts us into a position that sometimes we say, well, in my opinion, this passage literally means this, but it can also teach other truth. Now, I'm going to interject this every once in a while and say, this is my opinion, but you have to be the judge. I'm going to read to you a passage from Galatians chapter 4, and this is why I'm teaching this this morning. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24, Paul is going to tell us, let me give you an example of physical people doing historical events is actually not only literally true, but it's also an allegory. Now listen to the words. Galatians 4.21 Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. Now that means born according to a plan that they in the flesh was trying to help God keep his promise. You see how that was born of the flesh? While the son of the free woman was born through promise. That means God did this through Sarah in her old age, and even Abraham in his old age. Now, in verse 24, he says, Now this may be interpreted allegorically. That's what the scripture says. This may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar, and so on and so forth. And so... I want to take you to a passage of Scripture that, in my opinion, has great allegorical truth in it. And it's going to be up to you to think about it. It's going to be up to you to judge. Because we're going to read about Abel and Cain. And it's going to say that Cain slew his brother Abel. Slew him. No doubt. He bled out. And it says that his blood's going to cry out. Now, let's read. Let's, just, let's read these things, and we'll, we'll glean them as best we can. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now, now, Adam knew his wife, 
And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, we assume that this is Adam and Eve's first children. I don't think that's a bad assumption to do that. Cain was the firstborn. I don't think that's a bad assumption either. I believe that we may say that Cain assumed, being the firstborn, that he would be receiving some privileges that perhaps his siblings may not. Verse number two, and again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. Notice how we see, now we don't know how much time it, it, it has expired here. This could have been a few minutes. It could have been twins. It could be a couple years. We don't know. But we do know this. The only description we have between these two men is that one was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a worker of the ground. Now let's go back a chapter and remember what happened in paradise when, Cain, when, when, when their parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin. This was a place, in my opinion, that was literally there. These are literal people. These are not just uh, made-up allegories. But it contains allegorical truth based upon real people that really lived, that did actual things. But we can look at those things and learn more from them. Because if you recall, when our parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin, God said, cursed is the ground for your sake. He didn't say, Adam, you're cursed. No, he says, cursed is the ground. Now he goes and turns to the serpent, and he says, on your belly, you're going to go, and you're going to eat dust all your life. And then he turns back to the man, and he says, you know, you're just dust, and to dust you will return. Now, we put that together. We are dust made of the ground that has been cursed, and Satan is going to eat us. He consumes us. He comes to sift us. But when it comes to the ground that we are made of, our very nature is cursed. This is what we call original sin. It's not until chapter 4 that we see actual sins. Do you see the progression? How this moves from one to the other. It is the heart of man that is made of a cursed material. Our nature is cursed. Whenever we see someone do something, it's a little bit like this. Oh, look at that tree. Isn't it beautiful? It's got beautiful fruit. It's even desires because it has the ability to make one wise. None of those things were wrong. It's when they took and ate of it. And what is the difference? What is the difference when you can say, I looked at that fruit and admired it, and the difference in eating it? The difference is doing it. Doing it. Well, is it, I thought in the New Testament it says, if you look upon a woman to lust ever, you have committed it in your heart. So even looking. You see, the difference is, is that there was a heart that said, to know good and evil is to actually want and desire the evil. We cannot know it until we want it and to eat it. And the only way that is done is when you say, for a creature to know sin is for a creature to say, I have to truly desire that. We are not omnipotent and we are not omniscient. Only God knows good and evil without wanting evil. But we cannot have that knowledge unless we want it. And if we want evil in our hearts, we have a heart that is, by nature, completely separated from God. In the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Separated from the holy heart of God. And that ground that God would walk among the trees, the presence of God, where they would fellowship among all the trees. How many trees were there? Just two? No, all the trees of the garden. I don't know what kind of trees there were. I know that there was a tree of life in the midst of the garden. And they were not permitted to eat of that tree. But I want you to know this. That that tree now is offered. Why? Because the one who has been described 
as the lamb who has been slain from the foundation of the world has died and has risen. And now there is a tree of life that if you eat of this tree, you shall live forever. Why? Because we have been corrupted by a heart that truly wanted what was wrong. Our nature is that way. And then, like Cain, saw someone else that may be given something that they thought they were entitled to, perhaps the first right, perhaps what, whatever uh, he thought that he would have, but he was a keeper of that ground. He may have even thought to himself, I'm doing what Adam should have done. I am a keeper of the ground. I till the ground. I do this. And what do you give to God? You give everything that you thought would be pleasing to him. This is all my efforts. Is it not good? I'm giving you my very best. And I used to think this as a child. What was so wrong with that? He probably gave him the best of his fruit, the best of the potatoes, the best of the tomatoes, the best of everything. And yet God didn't like that because Cain brought from the ground, from his own heart, says, this is me, except me, except me. But, but his brother Abel came like, like Adam and Eve. They were given skins of creatures that were killed. Their life was taken from them. Blood had to be shed, and they had to be given a new covering. And Abel said, I'm not going to give you something from me. I'm going to give you something that an innocent died for me, as I had witnessed before. There is a big difference between these offerings. One is given in humility, knowing that they will not be accepted. Their works will not be accepted. Now, this is a lot of spiritualizing. This is a lot of allegorizing. Because when we see, when we listen to the idea that blood comes from the ground, the blood cannot speak. You, you know, I've been to the hospital. Boy, they, I gave so much blood. About three times a day, they would stick me with a needle. I, I'm, I feel like a pincushion. And never, never once did I hear my blood speak. No squeak, no squawk, no sounds, nothing like that. This is a image and a metaphor that says God hears the injustice. He hears the sin. He hears when the innocent dies and that action that God is completely aware of cries out to him and his holy character and everything about him that is good and upright hears. And he remembers. And he heard the blood of his brother, Cain's brother, Abel. His blood cried out, cried out from the ground. Now, I have a much longer sermon. I, and I'm going to be, I'm going to give you the, uh, just, the, the, you know, just the highlights of it. Just the highlights of it. Because I want you to understand that it's okay for you to read the scriptures and it doesn't have to be only literal. Do I believe that the sun stood still when Joshua had that battle for 24 hours? Yes, I do. Could it mean something more than that? Probably does. Did Moses literally part the Red Sea? Yes, he did. Could it mean something more than that? Yes, it could. All the things that we read about the power of God is amazing. It is something that causes us to give pause and say that the author of history is also the author of truth that can be gleaned. And I want you to read your book that way. I want you to read your Bible that way. I want you to seek out the truth. I know this is a promise. If you seek the truth, God's going to open your eyes and you will find it. How do I know that? Because the one who cannot lie has promised it. Now, you may say to yourself, oh, it's a little bit kind of, I, I, I don't know how far I can go. What if I just go haywire? Ask the Lord's Holy Spirit to guide you. To guide you. I want you to be less dependent upon me and more dependent upon your study of the Word. And you walk with God on your own. You know, it happens like that. You know, you know some pastors want everyone to be dependent upon them because it's job security. Look, you got three elders here, you put us all together, and we're almost one good one. And, and none of us are going to live that long. 
We have to have a church that can stand on their own. You have to be able to be brave enough to read the scriptures and say, open my eyes and let me see. Open my eyes, let me understand. Seek out the Lord while he may be found. Be brave enough, but also be humble enough. Don't just come up with the wildest guy, crazy ideas. Believe me. Gullibility is not a gift of the Spirit. Amen. Being willing to believe anything. Oh, I, I have great faith. You tell me what to believe, I'll believe it. No, 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 no. The Bible is filled with truth, and you must seek out the truth. Don't try to give yourself the testing of saying, well, I believe the, the Lord so much, I'll believe ridiculous things. No, the truth is the truth, and that's what you seek for. Now, there's so many things. You know, some people, I am so surprised at how many people say, do you actually believe that the Lord created the heavens and the earth in six days? I do. I believe the Lord literally created the heavens and the earth in six days. Can I learn much more than just that? You bet you I can. There seems to me much more the way it's laid out. The separation of light and darkness. Oh, well, that can't put too much in that. What are you talking about? The Lord separated the dark from the light, and he had pause to give you that information? What more does that mean? It talks about God brooding over chaos. How can the Almighty and the All-Knowing brood? How much effort does he put into it that in six days he created heavens and earth when he could have done it in a nanosecond, even less? He could have done it instantly. But he chose to do it in six days. And then he rested the one who is never winded. Two weeks ago, I walked out to the mailbox. I had to rest to get back in the house. The Lord created everything. He didn't have to need. He didn't need any time. He didn't even break a sweat and there are galaxies so far away, their light may not have even reached us yet. The amount of atoms that are interacting and the subparticle pieces that never miss a beat and never out of a path that he's not aware of. Everything that God knows is so fantastically un unknowable to us, and yet he chose it to do it in a certain way. Let us listen to the poet of the universe. Let us listen to the songwriter. Let us listen to when he says, my son has died and his blood cries out. Oh, what, do you, what, what does God hear when his own son's blood cries out? He is an innocent man that took upon. The only reason they murdered our Lord is because he was right. He was holy. And he challenged those that said, uh, this guy's come to take away our place. He's come to remove us. He thinks he's so good. And it was all of their envy, all of their pride, all of their covetousness that they focused on the only holy one on the whole planet. It all focused on him it, as though it drew their attention to the only good one. And they said, we need to get rid of him. And they shed innocent blood. And do you think that the Almighty that knows all things will not know when innocent blood is shed? And not only that, not only that, that when he died, the only reason that he died is that he had the sins of others within him, our sin. And when that sin is paid, we being in Christ, and Christ, because he was holy, was raised from the dead, we raise with him. Man. And you know why? Because he's given ears to us to hear the blood of Christ that pleads for sinners and says, come and buy without money. Oh, the blood of Christ cries out. <coughs> Can blood really cry? No, it cannot. But listen to the image. It's a metaphor. It's poetry. It's music. It's a song. It's beauty. 
And yet God sings to us in beauty. He writes the beauty of how he expresses it. How can blood cry out? In the gospel, every time it's preached, the blood of Christ cries out to those who need atoning for. He needs it. Let me read from Philippians. Indeed, I count as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. And for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Well, if you ever want to underline a phrase in your Bible, every time it says, in him, you need to remember that. Without being in Christ, we'll have nothing. Because everything that Christ has earned, everything that Christ has accomplished, he gives it to us as an inheritance because we are his brother and we are in him. And when he raised, we were in him and in Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Uh, we could preach on that for hours, couldn't we? I think you, you know that. That I may know this, that I may know the power of his resurrection. And I want us to understand that there are two things there. The power of his resurrection. God is almighty. Oh, he can do anything, and he can raise your body from the grave. He can raise us from the dead. There is no doubt about that. But the power of his resurrection that we see and celebrate today is much more than just the physical power of changing these bodies into a glorious body, of taking us out of the grave. It's much more than that. It is the power of living in an evil world, walking like our Christ, to walk in newness of life, that we should be dead in sin, but now alive, and we've been resurrected, born again, that we have been raised from our death. Mm -hmm. The Christian walks in newness of life. We are now walking in the power of his resurrection, even though we have these crummy bodies and they're wearing out. But we'll get new ones. But that doesn't mean that we don't walk in the powers of, of his resurrection right now. Mm -hmm. Right now. Mm -hmm. That by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We have a special Sunday today. We have new members coming in. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. We have our communion table we want to partake of mm -hmm. with our new members. A wonderful, wonderful time. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say this. There was a foreshadowing of our Lord's death when Abel was murdered. Mm -hmm. You can't have a good story without good foreshadowing. And don't, don't be mistaken. When I say story, I'm not talking fiction. Our Lord can create a story that's not fiction. And yet it is so perfectly told to us. The characters are so real because they are. The foreshadowing is so real because it is. Abel was killed for no other reason than that he offered to God what God wanted. And God had respect to his offering. But Cain was rejected. And Cain murdered his brother. If that's not a foreshadowing of Christ, I just don't know what is. And just like his blood crying from the ground, God said, I heard his blood. Let me tell you something. God hears the blood of his son. He hears the blood of his son, and the very fact that he rose from the dead is the declaration that God has approved the atonement and that he has accepted the atonement. And you know what that means? Being in Christ, you are accepted in Christ. Amen. Don't listen to people that say, oh, I want you to accept Christ. Mm -hmm. No, you better look out for God accepting you. Amen. God needs to accept you, and you can only be accepted by being in Christ, mm -hmm. by eating of the fruit of the tree of life. And what is that eating? Believing. What is the work that man should do to, to glorify God? What can we do to do the works of God? Believe on him whom God has sent. Mm -hmm. Your eating is believing. Mm -hmm. Your action, you go and pick that fruit, eat that fruit. You know what it is? Believing the gospel. Mm -hmm. Christ is on that tree. Mm -hmm. He is the tree of life. Yes. You look in the book of Revelation in the Apocalypse, you'll see paradise regained. 
and you'll see the blood crying out from the ground. Why? Because his name is this. He who has been slain from the foundation of the world. And that gives him the seal of approval. He does all these things as sitting on the throne until every enemy, enemy is made under his feet. <coughs> what a day to celebrate walking in newness of life. Mm -hmm. This is what Christ said. Fear not. I am the first and I am the last. And the living one. I died and behold I am alive evermore. Mm -hmm. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Mm -hmm. That's our Lord. Lord. That's our Lord. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll have the acceptance of our new members. Holy Father, we thank you that you have heard the blood of our Christ plead for our case. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for our sins. We praise you, Father, for the greatness of your work, for, for, for exalting and lifting up your Christ, giving him, Father, the glory of being resurrected from the dead because the grave could not hold our holy Lord. And so, Father, because we have believed and your Spirit has opened our eyes, we are accepted in him. And so we humbly come because of who we are, but we boldly come because of who he is. And so we thank you, Lord. Bless your people, we ask. Receive our worship this day, we pray in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. Now one of our brothers is going to come up and accept the members and new members in the fellowship. William and Tune, would you please come up? And uh, Scott and Kateri and uh, Elizabeth. And Mr. Lieberman, you can just stay right there. Right over here, right over there. Don't cross over there. All right, stay there. Um, th this is an answer to prayer, not because we just want to have a big church. We we, we want to have we want to have people that truly uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these uh, brothers and sisters have uh, been with us for a time, and they have uh, uh, demonstrated by going through our uh, members class.